Welcome, folks. I've gone ahead and stuck a link into the chat for uh, the meeting minutes. So while we're waiting to get started, if you guys could go add yourself there, that would be fantastic. For those watching hey, along, hello. good. Just saying hello. Hey. Um, so, just so folks remember, we do record this call and it does get posted to YouTube. Um, so, keep that in mind. Just good. Also, let me go ahead and stick. We've had a bunch more folks just join the link for the meeting minutes. So, you can go add yourself there as well. <laughs> See, peer pressure. <laughs> um, also, as always, if you guys, if folks have things they would like to see added to the agenda, um, then please feel free to go ahead and add them. Um, in particular, um, we're trying to track and report on the things that landed the past week and the things that are in progress. So if there are things that are not already on the agenda that match those criteria, please add them there. I want to make sure we give everybody calls out, call outs for the good work they do and that we get some sense as a community of what's coming down the pike. Oh, I'm already on your list. <clears throat> Shall we get going, Frederick? Yep, let's get started. So welcome to the next uh, Network Service Mesh meeting. So uh, we have this particular meeting, which occurs every week at 8 a.m. Pacific. We are also involved in the Telecom User Group, which occurs every first Monday at 8 a.m. and every third Monday at 4 a.m. We are also involved with the CNCF networking working group, um, which is currently being rebooted. So we will have time, we'll know what time that comes on pretty soon, so. Also, is anyone able to share the meeting minutes so we can all follow along as we go? I will continue on while we uh, while we wait for somebody to generously share meeting minutes. <laughs> so, major events that uh, that are coming up. So, we had a CNCF webinar recently. Um, I believe we're waiting for that to be uh, to be posted. So, oh. uh, I think I believe it's posted already. 
Did oh, they post they, it already? They, I think they posted it the same day. Um, yeah. Oh, cool. Yeah, let me let me go find the link. We we actually have a playlist of NSM videos that they've put together. I didn't even realize this till last week. <laughs> nice. Mm, yeah, it is. Uh, it's here. Ah, come on. We should probably ask if they'd be willing to split the meetings from the um, from the events, but not too important at this point. Don't think so. No, so we also have, so we also completed, uh, um, sorry, we also have Open Source Summit coming up in Lyon with a, with a talk accepted by Ivana and Radoslav, which is the introduction to NSM. So if you are going to be there, definitely feel free to show so, up. Whoever is sharing, we're currently seeing your code, not the meeting minutes. Strange, okay. <laughs> 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 the good news is it's all open source code. <laughs> no, no, the code is open source. That's all fine. It's just what, it, the so, code is so network service mesh, mesh, actually. <laughs> <laughs> so, so kudos yeah. for, for actively working during the meeting, uh, Radislav. That's appreciated. But <laughs> there we go. So, if okay. you ever want to, if you ever want to know what we're doing, <laughs> so cool. Um, sorry, my audio is doing a couple weird things. Can you still hear me? Yeah. Perfect. So we also have uh, KubeCon and Cloud Native Con North America coming up, where we have NSM Con announced, and we have the call for papers have already or proposals have already been closed, and the talks have already been um, posted for both KubeCon and NSM Con. So. Feel free to take a look at the schedule and uh, definitely definitely let us know what uh, what excites you as well. We have KubeCon and Cloud NativeCon Europe in March Whoa. through April coming up, which Ooh. is going to be in Am in Amsterdam. Uh, the call for proposals is already open, and so that's why we're we're calling it out at this point. And I believe the calls. For proposals, I think, and in January, who so we deleted? No, the end in November. Who did? did oh, in November. Deleted, okay. Who did, did deleted this? It was there just a minute ago. Yeah, it was definitely there. There it is. Okay. Sorry, I was trying yeah. to clean things up, and I cleaned up the wrong set of things. I was trying to, <laughs> I was trying to clean up the KubeCon North America uh, piece, and and instead made a complete mess of it. We should probably get links to the CFPs as well. Yeah. yeah. Oh, um, I, I made a mistake. The notifications are in January, but make sure you have your proposal in by November 22nd. Yeah, this means that before you go to KubeCon North America, you should send your proposals for the next KubeCon already. Exactly. Is, I would expect to at least go to not North America, see how things are going, maybe, I don't know, figure out what next things are that we want to talk about, but I don't know. Okay. It yeah, I think it's... I think it's the size. So the larger that the event gets, the more further out ahead they want to plan. And KubeCon's getting huge. Yes, but they, they also they move the dates like um, two months ahead. That like is true. Of end of May, it's like end of March. <laughs> so it's, uh, <laughs> uh, yeah. Cool. If anyone knows of any other events, let us know. So we also have the social media community team uh, and I believe I saw Lucina on the call so you have the floor uh, hello yes great, great. We can hear you. Uh, okay thank you <laughs> uh, so the last week um, we gained a few more followers 14 followed about 15 more and posted tweets and retweets 21 and I posted uh, and there's links to all the new posts. So posted the pre-registration for NSMCon. Be sure to add that to your KubeCon registration. And the $50 fee will go to the CNCF Diversity Scholarship Fund. The, I've also posted on the webinar October 2nd, I thanked our lunch sponsor, Juniper Networks, and also sent out a thank you to the four different network service network service mesh con sponsors. 
So this week I plan to promote the individual sessions and speakers that were selected in the lineup for NSMCon. I'll promote the sessions at KubeCon and send more reminders to pre-register to NSMCon and also promote the sessions at Open Source Summit in Europe later on in this month. So when available, I'd like to share a link to the Telecom TV interview from ONS. If there was a video of the 5G panel from Linux Foundation Networking, I'd like to share that as well. I did retweet the ONS Keynotes link and the Contributors Podcast when that's available. I'd like to share that as well. No, this is all fantastic. You, you just do such an amazing job helping us. It's very much appreciated. Um, also, in addition to all of this, you, you pointed out a nasty bug in the, the website in terms of being able to copy and paste text, which I think is now fixed. <laughs> oh, wonderful. Thank you so much. Oh, uh, yeah. It, it was one of those things. Almost everything is easy once you know you're screwed up. <laughs> yeah, we, we share everything except for the ability to copy and paste on our website. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So that should, that should be fixed now. That's awesome. That'll make everything easier. Thank you so much. <laughs> yeah. Great. Oh, so the other thing that may help you as well, I noticed you've been taking screenshots, um, but the anchors used to over scroll. That's also been fixed. So right. the links will show the things that you want them to show. Perfect. Oh, so we have announcements. Uh, do we still have fuzzing bugs available? I believe we do. Uh, these are great bugs for beginners um, because they pretty much tell you exactly where to look and they tend to be things like there is an, a, a, you know, some sort of unusual nil check that needs to go, there's a nil check that needs to happen or something like that. So these should be very, very good beginner bugs for people to get started. Um, we've been sort of intentionally holding them open so that beginners can grab them and work on them. Um, obviously, we'll go and fix them before the release uh, if it comes to that, but it, we would, they make really good things if you just want to pick up and try some stuff. By the way, I noticed we had a lot of additional folks showing up, so I'll repaste the link to the meeting minutes for folks so you can add yourself to uh, the meeting minutes. So please do add yourselves there. Cool. So we have the status of the project. So Ed, you have the floor. Cool. So th this is one where again, I, folks, please feel free to add your stuff. I, I'm not sure I caught everything going by. Um, but the first one I wanted to mention is we, you've probably noticed we've been having some in-domain testability issues that came out of the blue that didn't appear to be related to any code changes that we'd made. And they were all happening, I believe, in AWS. And so I think Artem has finally chased them down. We've got a candidate for what may be the root cause having to do with some wonkiness in an update that AWS made to its CNI. Um, do you want to say a few words about that, Artem? Or not? As far, as far as I know, Artem today is only listening. To oh, that's fine. That's fine. Some issues. Yeah, so effectively, um, Artem figured this out. It's a very obscure kind of problem. He's really good at those. Um, we think this is the root cause, um, and he's currently uh, attempting a fix that would downgrade to the previous release of CNI. It's a pretty good indicator it was the root cause that the upgrade to AWS CNI happened at exactly the same time that our interdomain pro tests started having issues. Um, but this, this is why we test on a bunch of different platforms so that we catch things like this. Um, and currently the tests have been disabled um, while we work on fixing the issue because there's no point in failing the code changes that have nothing to do with this, fail this CI failure. Cool. Uh, any questions on that? All right. So things that I noticed that landed this week. Um, so do you want to say a little bit, uh, Radoslav, about the kernel forwarder support for metrics? Um, yeah, so basically it got merged. <laughs> <laughs> but it sounds like it was very complicated. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, we, I, I think we slowed down that a bit. And, uh, but yeah, I guess it got merged. 
Um, so it introduces uh, metric support for the kernel forwarder. Cool. Um, so I I used the the model that uh, VPP was using with this source dash something and uh, destination dash something mm -hmm. that model. So cool. it's the same and it, it should be yeah interchangeable. Fabulous. Um, have you talked to Matthew Rahan? I don't know whether or not he's planning on doing any updates to the skydive support. Um, no, I haven't actually, no. It, it might be worth reaching out to him and see if he'd be interested in showing some of the metrics on those links. Uh, it's the kind of thing that he often likes. Uh, and he's been very kind to us on the skydive front. Plus he knows the skydive community people. They may even do it. Um, the skydive community has been incredibly generous with us. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, I, I, I will reach for him. Excellent. Um, I, if I can add just a couple of sentences here. Please. So uh, first, uh, this is actually, I mean, after we fig after Ivana figured out that, that, that there's some issues with, you know, the way that uh, the the agent based forward, you know, exposes metrics, uh, actually doesn't expose metrics, so there. Uh, <laughs> yeah, this is the first time uh, that we have some uh, actually working metrics based on the infrastructure that did exist essentially, so also I'm just yep. uh, to that what's existing. Uh, and based on this, essentially, Ivana has prepared a set of patches, uh, the PR, I believe, Ivana, that actually uh, adds uh, exposing the these metrics in a pr Prometheus database. Oh, that's fantastic. Um, could we add that to the in progress section? Uh, I'm current, it was finished, but I'm currently trying to build and uh, test it with latest ma ma master. I'm having some issues. Uh, with that, but uh, yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. It's upstream, it's up to date, but uh, I have some multi module <laughs> and other <laughs> issues hitting today. Okay, thank you. Awesome. Uh, could, you, could you please add it to the in progress so that we can follow up on the yeah. next meetings and see, yeah. so just add a link there or whatever yep. is yep. useful, then we'll take you know, it. Okay. Adding it to the in progress is super helpful because that's the first place I go mm -hmm. looking for things that have actually yeah. landed this week. Um, and then, of course, if we can do this, uh, like uh, if we can uh, help Matthew base his work on, on top of this and show some link statistics, that would be also oh, yeah. everyone, I believe. And, and I, I, I would love to also see, I presume that your patch has an optional way for us to install Prometheus so we can go look when we're playing on our own and see the Prometheus metrics land. Yeah. Um, that would be fantastic. Uh, yeah. Ivana, I don't know uh, about Prometheus, what was, I mean, uh, we talked about help charts and stuff. Yeah, I added them and okay, I'm good. trying to test them. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, looking forward to see the PR and review it actually. Good. They're upstream, but uh, I have some things to tidy up. It's uh, the CI is failing. Great. Uh, okay, cool, cool. Okay. That's awesome. So no, metrics are super important. Observability is super important. So I'm delighted to see this stuff finally landing. Um, and the good news is we should hopefully get a fix for VPP agent that will look at those metrics as well so that we can get that working too. But I'm glad that you guys continued um, moving all of this forward because it's important to get it done. I think that uh, VPP agent metrics are coming soon. Hopefully you will share PR with me uh, from the Legato community. Cool, excellent. So um, the next one on landed this week is the vastly improved build times. Do you want to say a few words about this, Ilya? <laughs> oh, yes, I can. Uh, now we build uh, binaries on host machine and then just copy the binary file to the Docker image uh, that help us to improve uh, the speed of building. And and also in that PR, I removed uh, many old targets that we had in uh, uh, K8 uh, make file. Mm -hmm. And I think that's all for it. I think that improve is a very weak word here. It's like, I don't know, maybe jetpacking the build or something like this. <laughs> so, I mean, I, I did run some local numbers myself before and after um, because I was curious. And, and I have almost the perfectly optimal build environment. I've got a very fast laptop. I have a very fast internet connection. And if I cleared out my Docker cache before, 
and started from a cold Docker cache, it was taking me 15 minutes to build everything. You know, make K8 save. Um, with this 15. new pack, sorry, 15. 15, 15. One yes. five. Yeah. With, with this new patch that vastly improves the build times, um, it's, it's down to a minute or less from a cold build. It's just incredibly faster. Have you tried uh, doing minus J4 or something like this? Because actually this works now. Oh, no, I haven't. That's awesome. Now I'm really yeah. excited. <laughs> oh, no, that, that's, that's, that's even more exciting. Um, Great job. Thank you, guys. Thank you. That, that's really... Yeah. Okay, J16. <laughs> okay. <laughs> My laptop isn't that cool. Um, <laughs> very cool. Mm -hmm. Cool. So next up, we had some open tracing improvements. Do you want to say some things about this, Andre? Yeah, uh, a bunch of open tracing improvements are added to both the SDK and the NSM. And actually, uh, I'm almost finished with SDK like approach for the NSM request and close. It's in a pull request at the moment and could be looked at uh, by you guys. So it do the same as we have a SDK for the endpoints, but do for the entire uh, chain of the requesting and closing the, uh, network service requests. Uh, so for now, open tracing shows uh, pretty cool. Uh, actually uh, traces I can have a short demo if I can share my screen Rodoslav could you please unshare your screen for a moment I will show how the open traces look at the moment okay done yeah <clears throat> okay do you see my screen Yep. Okay, nice. So uh, this uh, trace for a uh, pretty complex scenario when the data plane is die uh, on the remote side. So firstly, we do requesting a connection. So we can uh, figure out on any place what's happening on by looking to the attached the logs and so on. Uh, after, for example, we see the data plane down stuff uh, we know what is doing uh, sending a remote connection update if the data plane is down and on the uh, kubernetes master uh, node we receive uh, events and when we receive an event when the data plane is die we know what to do with healing and do the healing mm -hmm. itself with all the stuff and can figure out what's happening and mostly in real time. And if any error will occur, it will be marked here in open tracing as an error. So it's more obvious what to do with the all the chain. Yeah, so I mean, I, I think that what's really amazing about this is rather than having to fish through logs to figure out what's going on, um, when you have any kind of a problem, you can literally get down to the individual sub part of the code and what it was doing and where the error originated uh, through the system. And or you can also see what goes in and goes out at every step, plus any logs that are happening at any step. Yeah, uh, one more interesting point here is we just need to spawn uh, identifier from the uh, our init container. So for example, client do the request the first time and any uh, healing like data plane down and so on happening inside the NS manager will be automatically added to the first uh, traces uh, when we requested a connection. So all the uh, life cycle with healing will be automatically attached here. Oh, fantastic. That is really, really, really awesome. This should make it much easier to track down what's going on inside the system. Um, yep. So one quick question. Um, have we looked at the possibility of being able to export and attach the open tracing when we have CI failures? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually, it just could be added. Uh, uh, the trace could be downloaded uh, by using uh, uh, just uh, the curl stuff. So I wanted to do it next just to download all the spans uh, I need. 
just it's just JSON, and it could be uh, imported by the uh, Jagger UI just by putting the JSON file here to track what is happening. So the the, the so idea. It will, it, yeah, mm -hmm. it will be next step uh, for. Uh, I'm not sure if to, it will be a good idea to include for all possible tests, but I think about improving the cloud testing stuff to do if a test is failed to enable uh, tracing I, 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 and I run it right. with traces. Yeah, I think you're right. I mean, basically, if if we have test failure, that's that's probably when you would want to do it. Um, and we run yeah. it with, with traces, yeah. Yeah, because then then we can literally say, okay, well, we had a test failure, what happened? And you can drill straight into the tra trace and figure out what happened, uh, which should make yep, it yep. easier to track down test failures. Yep. Cool. That, that's, I find that very exciting, but I'm, I, I'm highly excited by things that make it quicker and easier to develop, so. Uh, and to operate, I mean, don't underestimate that, that part. That's true. Um, I mean, yeah, there's definitely um, oper uh, oper operability considerations here as well, because now if you've got some problem that goes wrong in the system, mm -hmm. you can see exactly where it went wrong. Um, it should hopefully lead to much more interesting bug reports as we start getting those in from the field. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Makes more work for us. Yep. Okay, that's, that's the kind of work we're looking for. Yeah, indeed. Cool. And then we had the SDK style refactoring of the VPP agent data plane. We had uh, that land this week. Do you want to say a few words about that, Denise? Probably I think Denise has some troubles <laughs> with your audio today. Uh, yeah, the SDK refactoring was uh, merged. Next mm -hmm. one will be the SDK like refactoring for my stuff for entire MSM. Mm -hmm. yep. And probably Radoslav will have to inspect this refactoring and figure out how, how, how the kernel folder could be and should I be aligned with this. Think, I think that that patch, I'm trying to remember, I, I want to say that that patch actually did um, it, at least make sure that nothing broke in the kernel folder. Yeah, of course. That's yeah. not the point. The point is like to also refactor it in, in the same way so that they all look uh, like uh, no, then that would be that would be that would be much appreciated. And I think mm -hmm. there was also I, I want to say I, I suspect that Radislav was actually part of the conversation on that PR, but I'm not sure. Yeah, he was. Okay. Well. So that's good. Cool. So that's the stuff that I that that landed this week that that came to my attention. Is there anything else landed this week that folks wanted to talk about? I. I don't have anything that landed this week, but I have a question because I will have to probably drop in a couple of minutes. So I just wanted to ask, I have put it on the bottom here, but I just want to bring it up with the community in general, because I think that it would be a longer discussion probably we should, you know, um, mm -hmm. get it next time probably. So essentially I was talking to some guys uh, around here on conference, etc., and I got a pretty complicated question that essentially boils down to how do we deal with, with noisy neighbor, neighbors? like? We don't have any quality of service notion, like SLA guarantees. I know that we have been saying, okay, so this is not, this is a function, this is not our thing, etc. But essentially providing some guarantees about a bandwidth or something probably is not that far from what we want to do with NSM. So I don't know, maybe, maybe it's a longer discussion. Maybe we need to create a PR spec, whatever. But they've been just in kind of in initial thoughts from from the community here. What 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 everyone is thinking? It's, it's about. a very initial. It, it's, it's it's definitely an important question, and it's a very interesting question. And and some of it is, and I think you partitioned it correctly, right? Because there are two places you might stick quas related stuff. One of them is in the NSM forwarders, and then the other one would be in the particular NSCs. And in fact, I think we have a talk um, at NSMCon where someone has actually. <laughs> stuck some interesting uh, cost discovery stuff into an NSE and they'll be talking about their, that there. Um, so you mean, but, uh, how the NSE is going to prevent me from flooding with, you know, just a, a random broadcast packets just. Yeah, no, 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 no. I, I, that, that, that's the question of the forwarder side. I was, that the comment I was making about uh -huh. the, the NSE side. I think there's potentially something there for both of them. Um, 
the other comment I'll make, having dealt with a lot of quas over the years as a really deep networking guy and having dealt with a lot of really low level forwarders, is that um, quas is almost never the answer. Sometimes it is, but it's almost never the answer. Because it turns out simple quas things, like policers, are very useful, right? Basically yeah. saying, I won't let you flood me out. Yeah. Complicated quas things like RSVP, where you're trying to reserve the bandwidth across a complicated system, <laughs> those are almost universally a bad idea. Um, <laughs> so, um, you know, and, and because it, the, the interesting thing about quas is, in a really high performance forwarder, um, doing whatever you're doing for quas actually consumes way more resources than it would take to just service the packets appropriately anyway, particularly <laughs> software forwarders. But policers are potentially very interesting. Um, you know, policers and shapers are potentially very interesting in, in, in the system. So I think there's definitely a really interesting conversation to be had here around what we might want to do. Um, so yeah, that, that, that is interesting. But the, the reason I sort of made the initial comment of Quas is almost never the answer is, at least half the time when someone ta wants to talk to me about Quas, they want to talk about the complicated RSVP version of Quas that's been sort of a universal fail. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> We can also look at some of the building blocks as well. So if we take a look at how NSM is built, we we know wh which streams come from where, not only from an individual endpoint, but also across a whole flow of packets. And we also have all of the uh, the monitoring primitives there as well. So it may be possible to have something that can monitor the um, the overall quality of a connection at a, at a high level uh, from end to end. And if we see that there's uh, issues with uh, noise or, or something similar, uh, we sh it should be possible to get enough context on any given connection and any given node that we can then have something uh, try, to, try to remediate in, in a variety of different ways. But uh, like the first start, the first part is getting all the primitives there so that we can measure measure it without destroying the um, the overall performance of the of the system. Yep. And so, and, and th this is almost certainly going to be more interesting coming from an NFE perspective than an enterprise perspective because the NFE guys potentially could produce an amount of traffic that would produce these kinds of noisy neighbor problems as they're flowing through a CNF. Um, there's just no way that an enterprise app is going to produce enough traffic to matter. Um, they, they just can't, they can't drive enough traffic um, compared to the speed at which the forwarder can forward. So, so um, it, but this, this, this gets to be even more interesting when we start getting the hardware next stuff in, because right now, if you really want to be driving enough traffic through the box to have this be an issue, you can't have the kernel in the way, right? It just doesn't work. Mm -hmm. So, but I think this is a very good question. Um, and, 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 you know, I'm trying to think of like the places you might stick it in. <clears throat> um, my initial thought would be that maybe a cross context might be the way to handle it as part of the connection context. Mm -hmm. yeah, um, just kind of requesting bandwidth or kind of, I want the guarantee of this. Well, I mean, you, you, you have to be careful about what people believe when you say things like requesting bandwidth. Because again, we can give them shapers and policers, but I don't think we can actually guarantee bandwidth. Uh, okay, best effort. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, yeah, I mean, it's, it's sort of the, the difference between the RSVP approach versus the, the policers and shapers that actually do kind of work. Um, because it, it, if you say, I can guarantee you bandwidth, that could mean a number of things. It could mean things like, I guarantee you bandwidth through your forwarder. I guarantee you bandwidth out of the box, you know, from, from here to the, the actual physical network. Mm -hmm. um, what most people who want a guaranteed bandwidth really want is end-to-end -end guarantees, but then you're into the world of RSVP and we all know how that story ends. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah. you know, it, but, but it's, an interesting, it's an interesting problem to think of if we can think of something smart there. Um, I'm, I'm totally open to exploring possible solutions as long as we okay. don't go down I mean, maybe we'll even come up with a smart solution that, that, that gives you the things you wanted from RSVP that isn't RSVP, and that would be glorious. Um. <laughs> so at, at least my understanding is that this, this is not something that we want immediately. It's just kind of an open question that probably people are going to ask 
more and more. If someone asks me, then probably there will be someone else that will figure it out and say, okay. Uh, but but more importantly, yeah. it's going to take us a while to think about. So getting the idea seated mm -hmm. that we need to start yep. thinking about it is yep. really important. Yep. It's not going to be something that we, we figure out a fast solution to. Mm -hmm. I, I sort of cavalierly said we could, we could add a class context, but that's actually not the hard part of the problem. Okay. Yeah, I mean, and I suspect some of these requirements come from uh, from his, some historic areas. Like you look at something like ATM, like ATM, we can give you a guarantee that a certain circuit will hit a certain level of bandwidth. And um, when you look at the line of thinking over time, uh, the uh, ATM crowd shifted towards the MPLS and then eventually are shifting towards something like SR, SRV6 and so on. And so some of those thoughts, I think, are, are still pre prevailing from that concept of I want a dedicated circuit that provides me a thing exactly, but it's also very rigid and doesn't allow for uh, the system to basically refactor itself over time as the, as the conditions change. Okay, so I don't it's know. A, it's a balance. Yeah, I, I, I see where you were going, but this is slightly more a telco like kind of point of view and it's absolutely valid whatever you're saying i think it's that specific context where i had these conversations mostly about okay i live in the cloud and you you give me a network link i want to be sure that i'll be able to send my five packets when i want them not that all the bandwidth will be taken by my neighbor that actually is doing some weird stuff there and yeah no, no, it, it, it's interesting and the thing is it's not just the atm guys um if anybody who's ever dug into Doxis and how cable modems work, like those guys, like they do quas like you would not believe. Um, if the Doxis guys tell you that you can have 10 bytes every 10 milliseconds, plus or minus one millisecond, that is exactly what you will get. Uh, they are not fucking around. Um, <laughs> they're, I, I have no idea. I mean, I'm sure they have applications where it matters, but man, are they really serious about that. Okay, that's a conversation to be continued, I believe. Yeah, yeah. So I, think, I, think, I think the short answer is if they need Doxis, we can pair, we can pair them to it. <laughs> <laughs> well, but the, the interesting thing about Doxis is even Doxis doesn't try and really give you end to end. It's giving you the moral equivalent of a single link. It, you know, that, that class is the moral equivalent of the class you get on the last hop. So, which is part of why they were so amazingly successful at it. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Okay. Cool. No, that that's a good discussion, and thank you for raising it before you had to to, to drop. Okay. Cool. Uh, so, moving back to in progress, so the API discussion stuff is continuing. Um, I think what I'm probably going to do just to start moving that ball forward is break out just the API piece as a PR, so that we get something we can merge, and then do one for the helpers, and then do one for the sort of converters and compatibility layer. Um, and then we have the pieces in so we can start looking at the strategy we discussed last week of building, of wrapping things in the various adapters. So we did an extensive discussion of the API stuff last week if folks want to go back and, and look into that. Um, and then, you know, the, the slides are actually up there. You can go take a look at them as well. They're linked here. Um, the next up is for you, Andre, the uh, network style, SDK style refactor of network service manager. Yeah, uh, I think we are mostly ready. So uh, today I've uh, working on last uh, two tests failed inside it. So I hope it will pass VCI and it will be looked at more carefully. Uh, I have uh, made a few attempts to make it into smaller pieces, but it actually took, uh, it took more and more and more time. So uh, I would, I think, ask you guys to try uh, review it in the current shape about uh, 16 changed files at the moment most of them are uh, pretty simple uh, since it's adjusted different chains of operations like uh, um, data plane programming uh, or assigning a connection or creating a cross connect and so on so most complicated uh, changes are related to the monitors uh, and how it is handled but in general it become more easy to read and to understand uh, than before so i hope it will go in this way cool 
That's excellent. <clears throat> awesome. So then, um, excellent. So we, we've got the Ethernet context stuff, and I, I think this is still in progress. Uh, I know Denise doesn't have his audio right now, so you probably can't talk about it. But he basically decided this was easier to do after the uh, data plane refactor. Um, and this effectively was put in to solve a problem we had on heal, where um, if we healed you to a different NSC, you might have the Ethernet address of the previous NSC in your ARP cache. And so you might not immediately get service while the ARP cache figured out that there was a problem uh, and got invalidated. And so the Ethernet context stuff will effectively allow the NSC to communicate back its Ethernet context so that when we have to do a re-request for a heal, um, we can get the same Ethernet context from the new NSC. So SRV6 support. Um, that's still in progress. I think Artem is working on that. It's currently blocking on a fix from VPP still, but they now have figured out what they think the problem is, and so there should be a PR shortly. I know there, there are certain people on this call who are very interested in the SRV6 stuff. So, cool. Uh, the kernel forwarding plane, Radoslav, I, I know we sort of had this held over. Is there anything in progress there? Um, nothing much, I think. No, nothing. Okay, cool, cool. Um, Azure pipelines. So um, Alex has been working on porting our CI from Circle C to Azure pipelines. Do you want to say a few words, Alex, about how that's going? Well, the things are going not that fast, but uh, I'm in progress, and uh, today I'm. I think I uh, got success with Helm charts. So we are continuing and integration tests running okay. And after uh, the whole CI thing will stabilize, we, I, we can continue to, um, to build in a, a parallel Azure, Azure pipeline CI uh, beside the Circle CI and then to switch to a new CI, something like that. That would be great. I mean, the, the Azure pipelines, um, one of the advantages they have is that, that, that Microsoft has very kindly donated enough capacity for us to run our CI on them for free, um, which is quite, quite kind of them. Um, so hopefully we can get switched over and, and you know, they, they, it looks like quite a nice system. Cool. Um, Ilya, do you want to say some things about security number four or the JWT stuff? Oh, yes, uh, PR actually is ready and it's even past the whole CI. It's green, so please take a look. Oh, fantastic. That's very good. Cool. And then, I Ivana, do you want to say some things about the metrics observability stuff? Um, I think I don't have something more. Um, okay. That's fine. Yeah. Cool. So I think that's we're to the end of the agenda. Is there anything other folks would like to discuss? Well, if there's uh, nothing else, then um, we can yield back 15 minutes of time. Cool. All right, well, since uh, nothing else has come up, uh, thank you all for, for attending, and we will see you all at the same time next week. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks. Sure. Thank you. Bye. Bye.